Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 17660 in the name of Mark Ruskell on the restricted roads 20 miles per hour speed limit Scotland bill. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Mark Ruskell to speak to and move the motion. Mr Ruskell, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Since devolution, there have been choices for this parliament to make, to break from the status quo, to be bold and lead the change. From the smoking ban to alcohol minimum pricing, this parliament has led the way in making small changes which will have a big impact on the health of our nation for generations to come. Today, I'm asking parliament to take another step forward to make our streets and communities permanently safer. 20 mile hour speed limits make a big contribution to the safety of everyone on the streets where we live and especially to children. They reduce speed, prevent deaths and injuries, encourage choices to walk and cycle, while public support for them continues to grow year on year. Yet they remain exceptions to a blanket 30 mile an hour rule set nearly 90 years ago, expensive to introduce and inconsistently applied. A postcode lottery as to whether a community is protected with our most deprived communities often left behind. So I am asking Parliament to consider the fundamental question here. What should the default speed limit be on the streets where we live? And if the answer to that question is 20 miles an hour, then this bill is the only credible approach that delivers that goal in a way that is nationally consistent, timely, and cost-effective. Presiding officer, I've been delighted over the last three years to have worked with a wide range of organizations, from councils to public health bodies, road safety organizations, schools, and many thousands of individuals who back this bill. Public support has been strong and countless studies have shown the majority of the public support 20 limits and that that support goes up once they're introduced. Over 1,900 people responded to the initial consultation on the bill. Well over 6,500 people responded to the consultation the committee ran, showing 62% support. And in building the case for the bill, I'd like to thank in particular Rod King and the team at Twenties Plenty, providing support through their extensive networks across the UK. I was delighted to be invited to address meetings in Wales last year, including in the Senate, where there is now a strong cross-party consensus, with the First Minister recently announcing that Wales will be switching to a 20 mile an hour default national limit. Their proposal to allow councils to retain 30 limits on a minority of roads that they're choosing exactly mirrors my own bill here, and it will make Wales the first 20 mile an hour nation in the UK. I'd also like to thank councils for their active support. Orkney, Shetland, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Angus, East Renfrewshire, Dumfries and Galloway, Midlothian, Renfrewshire, Stirling, East Dumbartonshire, Highlands, Angus, Aberdeen and South Lanarkshire councils have all been strong supporters. Glasgow City Council recently passed a motion in support. While City of Edinburgh have said that this bill would have halved the cost of their 20 mile an hour rollout had it been in place at the time. Councils that want to make the streets where we live safer want a default 20 limit. And it's only a small minority of councils, most notably the borders, who are out of step in wanting to choose whether to implement 20 limits or not. But why should a child growing up on a street in Gala Shields deserve any less protection than a child living on a street in Edinburgh, presiding officer? Throughout the development of this bill, my team has also worked closely with the Society of Chief Officers of Transportation Scotland, who are the representative body of all our roads authorities. Now, these are the people who would be directly responsible for implementing the bill, and I'd like to thank them for their <coughs> input into the costings and their continued support, which was reaffirmed again last night in their formal response to the committee's report. Many councils are now awaiting the introduction of this bill to make the full rollout of 20 cheaper and easier across all their communities. On the public health case, I've been delighted to work with organizations including the Royal College of Child and Pediatric Health, the Glasgow Centre for Population and Health, the Faculty of Public Health, the British Heart Foundation, the British Lung Foundation, and NHS Scotland, who again all back this bill. The Glasgow Centre were instrumental in helping us understand the impact this bill would have on protecting and saving lives. And their study showed that even with a modest reduction in average speeds, the bill would save five lives, 750 casualties, and 39 million pounds every year. 
Now, these are real people whose lives would be saved and transformed and real savings that will keep coming each and every year for decades to come, simply for the cost of changing the road signs. If I can get the time back, presiding officer. But... Yes, you can, yes. Excellent. There's, a, there's okay. time in hand in this debate, good. so I can be very flexible, which is good for everybody. Mr Kerr. Thank you. I thank the member for taking the intervention. Just a, a question on all uh, what he's just been saying about the, the impact of reducing the speed limits, but doesn't, doesn't he concede that that only happens if the Im impact of the bill is to actually reduce in practice the speed limit uh, as he wishes? Mark Ruskell. Well, yes, that's quite a basic question, and I would point the member to the extensive policy memorandum that details all the studies that show what kind of speed reduction we would be looking at if we implemented 20 across the nation. The bill is predicated on the existing rollout of 20 miles an hour across cities across the UK, so we're not starting with some kind of you know, rocket science here. We know the impact of 20 mile an hour zones already. We know what the impact will be if we go for a national default. Now. We also know the devastating impact, presiding officer, that a fatality can bring to families, to whole communities. Even minor incidents can destroy a person's confidence, leaving them unable to cycle or be fearful of traffic for the rest of their lives. Now, the Royal College of Child Pediatric Health said the bill would, and I quote, have an immediate beneficial impact on the health of children and young people, creating safer places to walk, cycle and play, reducing fatal and non-fatal injuries. And I've also been pleased to work with a huge range of other organizations who know this bill will make a transformation in the livability of our communities. Sustrans, Living Streets, Cycling UK, British Cycling, Scottish Cycling, Transform Scotland, Pedal on Parliament, The Ramblers, Friends of the Earth, Paths for All, Brake, Spokes, Go Bike, Guide Dogs, and dozens and dozens of community councils and parent councils all back the bill. A joint letter from over 20 national bodies and the newly appointed Active Nation Commissioner Lee Craigie was clear and unequivocal in its support, saying that a Scotland-wide reduction in speed limits will save lives every year, not only through reduced casualties, but as more people choose active forms of travel and the air quality in our communities improves. We cannot wait for individual local authorities to implement this in a few limited areas as and when they have the resources. We cannot wait for more studies. Now, the Royal Economy Committee uh, heard many of these arguments. Indeed, they were highlighted in their report, a report which concluded that sign-only 20-mile-hour limits deliver important increases in walking and cycling and agreed that, and I quote, 20-mile-an-hour zones can contribute to social inclusion, quality of life, and the livability of neighbourhoods and streets. It went on further to say that it supports the development of 20-mile-an-hour zones in Scotland, especially where pedestrians are present and acknowledges the road safety benefits this would deliver. So how is it that both the committee and the government could then conclude that there should be discretion given to councils to do nothing on 20 miles an hour? Quite unfathomable, because we know that the current blanket 30 mile an hour limit will continue to kill, to maim, and to destroy lives. And that's a fact that every MSP must think on when they choose which way to vote on this bill. Presiding officer, if this government wants Scotland to be the best place for children to grow up, then prove it. Make their streets safer places to play, walk and cycle. If this government backs 20 miles an hour as the safe speed limit in those streets, then please don't leave it to a postcode lottery. Leave the change in Parliament and back this bill for the sake of all future generations. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Rusko. I now call Edward Mountain on behalf of the committee. Mr Mountain. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to contribute to the debate as convener of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. The committee's stage one report was published on the 31st of May. Our report is clear in that the committee supports the policy aim behind the bill of seeking to widening the implementation of 20 mile an hour zones in Scotland with the, aim, with the objective of reducing death and serious injury on roads. I'd like to thank the member in charge for promoting this important objective and for his recent response to our report. I'd also like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for helpfully responding to the report before today's debate. I'd also like to thank all those that submitted evidence to the committee and also to the clerks for their help and support during this process. It is important to highlight that the committee heard very mixed views on the bill. Furthermore, the available research was often mixed and its conclusions 
was often very inconclusive. This has shaped the committee's conclusion on the bill, which I will now turn to. <coughs> Indeed, uh, I, I'm prepared if there's time back. But I have already said, Mr. Uh, Mountain, there is time in hand for everybody, okay. so uh, do uh, not uh, be feared. In, 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 in giving way, I, Are you I, giving would, way? I would ask the member to remember that I am reflecting the views of the committee and will do so carefully. Well, you've been told, Mr Finney. Mr Finney. Yeah, well, I'm grateful for the member taking intervention. The, the, the interve I absolutely accept that the, the convener will do that. I was just going to ask, was the convener going to come on to the fact that whilst we did hear mixed views, it's also the case that members made different interpretations of the same evidence that they heard? Mr Mountain. Indeed, and as I make pro progress through my speech, I, I will try and reflect that the fact there was a difference of opinion of members, of course. On the issue of public health issue outcomes and social benefits, the committee concluded that the 20 mile an hour sign-only zones contribute a small but important increase in active travel modes, such as walking and cycling, due to an increased perception of safety. We also acknowledge that reducing the speed limit might improve air quality, although the evidence on this, this issue was inconclusive. We also felt that the 20 mile an hour speed limit zones might contribute to social inclusion, quality of life, and the livability of neighborhoods and streets, but only effectively if they were part of wider urban placemaking. When it comes to journey times and congestion, Again, the committee heard mixed views on whether 20 mile an hour speed limits would have an impact on either journey times or indeed traffic congestion. The available research suggested that 20 mile an hour speed limits do not generally have significant impact on either of these. Now turning to the practicalities of implementing the bill, I'd like to highlight the following points on behalf of the committee. The bill proposes that its provisions be commenced at the end of a period of 18 months after the enactment of the bill. However, the public agencies who would implement the bill's provisions called for a longer period, given existing and forthcoming commitments. When it comes to compliance and enforcement, the committee found that the current compliance with 20 mile an hour speed limits is poor, and a combination of measures such as traffic calming and speed limits is more effective than a speed limit by itself. Uh, I am prepared on, on, the, on the same basis. Andy Whiteman. I thank the member for taking intervention. Um, the point is made about, for example, uh, the two points is made about uh, compliance and um, his previous point, I apologise, which I just missed, are, are both uh, issues that can, uh, the, the, the commencement, um, are both issues that can be addressed as, as a bill like this uh, proceeds uh, through Parliament. Um, they're not germane to the principle of the idea about what the default speed limit in Scotland should be. Would you agree? Mr Mountain. Well, Mr Whiteman, I'm sure, I'm sure other members of the committee will comment at, actually on that. But what we did hear from Police Scotland is that they do not prioritise enforcement of current 30 mile an hour or 20 mile an hour zones. Police Scotland confirmed that they are focusing on enforcing speed limits on higher speed roads, where serious accidents were more likely to occur. I, I'm afraid I've taken two interventions. No, I've taken two interventions. It is fair, and I think it is fair to actually allow the convener to try and put the committee's view across without questioning him on the committee's view, which we'll have an opportunity to do to each committee member. Now, Police Scotland, as I said, is focused on enforcing limits on higher speed roads. Now, this might not be viewed as an impediment to compliance with 20 mile an hour speed limits. However, the committee was of the view that the proposals in this bill would be unlikely to result in a change to the approach taken by the police in enforcing speed limits. On the issue of public awareness, the committee heard that a detailed concerted campaign would be required to raise awareness of the proposed reduced speed limit should the bill be passed. We learned that this campaign would need to be more extensive and sustained than the bill proposes. Overall, it would need to contain a major shift in cultural understanding of why the speed limits exist with the aim of increasing compliance rates. The committee also found that the existing process for local authorities to implement 20 mile an hour speed limits are cumbersome and resource intensive. We are of the view that these should be more straightforward to make the process easily and easier, sorry. 
Consequently, we welcome the Scottish Government's current exercise with COSLA and the Society of Chief Officers of Transportations in Scotland to consider ways in which these processes can be simplified and improved. And I note the Cabinet Secretary to the response to the committee does not provide any further information on this exercise. However, I would ask him on behalf of the committee to ensure that the committee is kept updated on the progress and outcomes of this review. On costs, the committee also heard about wide-ranging uncertainties on the estimated costs and savings of the bill, leading it to conclude that the financial memorandum is not robust. Costs that were not fully recognised include the following. Assessment of effective roads, local authorities wishing to retain some roads at 30 mile an hour zones, establishing total numbers of restricted roads that would be subject to the bill's proposals, given that that number of roads is not known. No estimation of staff or resources in the police force and criminal justification, uh, justice system. And also the Scottish Government costs for the trunk roads network. Now, the Cabinet Secretary has clarified in his response that the Scottish Government would have to provide additional financial support to local authorities if this bill were passed. However, this financial support would have to come from existing transport budgets, potentially diverting resources away from existing activities. Finally, the committee also noted the very clear message given, to the Scottish, given by the Scottish Government through the Stage 1 process that a great deal of further consideration to the process, impact and consequences of a nationwide default 20 mile an hour speed limit would be required before it be in a position to fully support the bill. Presiding officer, the key points the committee has had to be is to determine whether the bill's proposal to introduce a 20 mile an hour speed limit on all restricted roads in Scotland by default is the most effective way to deliver a significant increase in 20 mile an hour zones. Our majority view is that the default approach in the bill is not appropriate as it does not give local authorities the flexibility to devise 20 mile an hour limits that they consider appropriate for their areas. As a result, the committee is unable to recommend the general principles of the restricted roads 20 mile an hour speed limit Scotland bill to the parliament. And I do look forward to hearing the contribution from other members of the Parliament and the Committee during this debate. Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Mountain. I now call Michael Matheson to open for the Government. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, I'd like to thank Mark Ruskell for bringing forward his Members' Bill, which has generated a wide-ranging national debate on 20 mile per hour speed limits. I followed the committee's consideration of this bill closely and would like to thank its members for their diligent but comprehensive scrutiny of the proposals set out in this bill. I note the findings of the committee and whilst I'm sure this was a difficult decision to reach, it highlights the complex nature of this very matter. I'd like to briefly explain why the Scottish Government is not in a position to support the bill. We are committed through Scotland's road safety framework to 2020 to reduce road risk. Scotland has well-established casualty reduction targets and we have been successful in making progress on these targets in recent years. The government is also committed to an active travel vision where communities are shaped around people with walking and cycling the most popular choice for shorter everyday journeys. This bill brings together two different issues which we need to ensure are not conflated. The first is whether 20 mile per hour speed limits are beneficial. And the Scottish Government's view is very clear that we support 20 mile per hour limits implemented in the right environment because they have real potential to encourage more active travel and increase people's perception of feeling safe. The second is whether the blanket approach is the best way of achieving this desired benefit. I'm of the view, yes, I'm happy to give way. Andy Whiteman. The Minister mentions a blanket approach. Indeed, that reflects the language of the committee's one size fits all. I mean, surely as a matter of principle all around the world, a default speed limit is a default speed limit. It is a one <laughs> default speed limit. It is a one size fits all. The only question is whether it should be 30 or 20. 
Cabinet However, Secretary. Uh, let's go back to the point which the committee was making, uh, Mr Whiteman, and that is about compliance with it and making sure that it effectively operates and that we also make sure that the default speed limit is one which we can get greater levels of compliance with. And the evidence shows that if you do not provide the additional measures alongside that reduction speed limit, compliance is not of a good standard. The aim of, uh, I'm of the view that the further, further consideration needs to be given to the process, impact and consequences of a nationwide default 20 mile per hour speed limit, including an assessment of Scotland's road network before we can be sure that the proposed bill will achieve its aim. We need to ensure that there are no unintended consequences from the bill, such as whether reducing speed limits on restricted roads where a 20 mile per hour limit could have detrimental effect or whether not reducing the speed limit on non-restricted roads where a 20 mile per hour speed limit would be desirable and inhibit consistency across the country. Alison Jones. Yeah, um, the, the Minister suggested we don't pass laws unless we're absolutely sure that they're going to be enforced. Did the Minister take that view when Scotland decided to ban smoking in public places? You know, you have to have a vision, Minister. You don't like presumed liability. You won't pay for infrastructure. You're not interested in reducing the speeds on our roads. Just exactly what are you going to do to make Scotland's streets safer for people? Michael Matheson. Well, uh, General Officer, as I've made very clear, the Scottish Government supports the introduction of 20 mile per hour zones. What we don't support is a one-size-fits-all blanket approach to all restricted roads, which is what exactly this bill proposes to do. In order, Zain Officer, to achieve the, let me make some progress in the matter. In order to achieve the benefits that 20 mile per hour speed limits bring, particularly on road safety, we need to ensure their compliance. Police Scotland were clear in advising the committee that speed limits should be effectively self-enforcing and seen to be appropriate by a significant majority of motorists. By implementing speed limits which are appropriate to the road design and conditions, rather than applying a blanket 20 mile per hour sign only speed limit, it ensures that other speed limits are not brought into disrepute. I note the committee's conclusion. The approach proposed in the bill is making, making all restricted roads default to 20 miles per hour before carrying out an assessment of these roads to examine whether the current speed limit profile and road design would mind themselves to sign only 20 mile per hour speed limits is not appropriate as it restricts local authorities' flexibility in devising 20 mile per hour limits that they consider appropriate in their areas. I'm happy to give way to the member. Daniel Johnson. I'm grateful for the minister giving way, but could you please explain to me if a road is designed and acceptable to drive at 30 miles an hour, what on earth would mean it's not appropriate to drive at 20 miles an hour on the self-same road? I don't understand. I, I'd appreciate an explanation. Cabinet Secretary. If you, if you consider the committee's report, they highlight the very fact that design features are key factors that influence the speed at which people drive on roads, which is why, for many 20 mile an hour zones in local authority areas just now, they have additional traffic calming measures in order to achieve compliance. Sign only 20 mile per hour speed limits do not achieve that type of compliance. And the evidence from cities have taken that approach has demonstrated that. That's why, President Officer, I remain convinced that local authorities are best placed to make local decisions based on their local knowledge and evidence on where 20 mile per hour speed limits should be implemented. Both the government and COSLA have always recognised the ambition of this bill and understand the rationale. However, the practical challenges of a one-size-fits-all approach are significant. Both the government and COSLA remain supportive of creating safer roads for all road users, but this must be achieved through identifying alternative, more flexible ways of widening the implementation of 20 mile per hour zones and speed limits in Scotland. Therefore, we are taking forward a range of work with our partners to identify more straightforward, efficient, effective procedures for local authorities in order to encourage wider use of 20 mile per hour speed limits. One example of the work being undertaken 
is a review of the current traffic regulation order process, which will determine whether this does create a barrier to the implementation of 20 mile per hour speed limits. We have sought the views of local authorities on TRO process and provided and provide an opportunity for them to detail their concerns and consider whether the process could be streamlined. Once that analysis is complete, we will share the results with stakeholders and outline what options can be taken forward to improve that process. These solutions, I, mean, I want to make progress and I'm about to finish here as well. These solutions can be taken forward through collaborative working with our partners within local authorities. I consider the blanket sign only approach proposed within this bill without the identification of the roads which would be affected will not achieve its aims. The road assessment is required in order to examine where the current speed profile and road design would mind themselves to sign only 20 mile per hour speed limits and will achieve the benefits that we all wish to see. General Officer, given all of the above, I support the conclusions and recommendations from the committee, but I can also assure the Chamber that we will continue to take forward measures to assist our colleagues in local government to introduce a wider range of 20 mile per hour speed limits within urban areas. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, I now call on Jamie Green to open for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start uh, by sincerely thanking Mark Rusko uh, and his staff and his team for bringing forward uh, this piece of legislation. We appreciate the hard work that goes in, into uh, a member's bill. Uh, I can only imagine the workload that it's added to his office. And to give credit to the member, he took a great deal of time and effort in the very early days of this to meet opposition members, share his thoughts and listen to our views and concerns from day one. I was equally happy to welcome the Twenties Plenty group into my office uh, and have a very frank and productive conversation with them, uh, such as uh, and was my goodwill to approach this bill logically and indeed respectfully. And I should also say that even though the majority view of the committee was not to recommend the general principles of the bill, that does not mean that on these benches we do not support the concept of lowered speed limits or zones. And nor do I think it, is this the end of the road in terms of how we as a parliament and politicians hold the government to account on this issue. Now, when the bill was originally announced, I won't lie, I was quite skeptical about it. But as a member of the committee, as my party spokesman on transport, uh, as a pedestrian, a cyclist, and indeed a driver, I approached this de debate with an openness to listen and to learn. And what struck me the most about the evidence sessions that we had in stage one was the sheer inconsistency of evidence, data that was presented to us and the conflicting and to be honest at times confusing views presented. I see members nodding their head but I sat there for every evidence session. The committee found it genuinely difficult when we met in private after the evidence sessions to agree the outcomes and sum up the veracity of the evidence received. Now there was a bit of me hoping that such would be the strength of that evidence that it would be profoundly helpful one way or the other, but it wasn't. And I appreciate that the recommendations of this report will not please everyone. It must be deeply disappointing and frustrating to the lobby uh, who support the bill. But I can assure members that we approached this and we considered this issue diligently in the way that committees of this parliament should. We gave the member and the bill the respect that it was due. But we did come to the conclusion uh, that we could not support it. It didn't feel in any way like a victory to those who weren't keen on the bill from day one. And I'll be honest, is the status quo on how 20 mile per hour zones roll out in this country, is it working perfectly? Does every community who wants a reduced speed limit zone in their area able to do so easily or efficiently? And if the answer is no to that question, then I would suggest that today's debate is not the end of the conversation, but should be the beginning. Because any suggestion that the committee did not approve the principles of this bill because we do not care about public safety or about children or cyclists or pedestrians or we do not care about the environment, those criticisms are misguided and indeed unhelpful. Uh, yes. Daniel Johnson. I thank the member for giving me. On, on one hand, I, I do appreciate that he would like to go further in 20 miles. So can he enlighten the chamber as to how the Conservative Party will be bringing forward proposals on 20 mile an hour limits in the next manifesto? 
Jamie Green. Yeah, as I said, we were happy to support uh, the rollout of further 20 mile per hour zones. Two things on that, and I, I was going to come on to it, but I'm happy to address it now, is that the current TRO process, as the committee suggested, is cumbersome, it is onerous, uh, and it is difficult for local authorities who want to introduce those zones. That must and should improve. That's the first thing that will be in uh, uh, my, my view on that. Uh, but secondly, as others have mentioned, I think it's up to local authorities to make those decisions. Uh, and I do not think that the approach that the bill took gave sufficient flexibility for local authorities to do what is right in their areas. Because what is right for urban Scotland may not be right for parts of rural Scotland. Uh, I appreciate lots of people. I, please let me make some progress. And then if I, if I could, if I, I do have a lot of other points to make. I will make some progress and then I'll happily let some members in. Um, we heard from a wide range of stakeholders. Um, and I won't go into some of the issues. I think lots of other members uh, who uh, either sit in the committee or have a, an interest in this will go into the evidence that we got. Um, but I do think we need to look at the practicalities of what a nationwide change from 30 to uh, 20 miles per hour would look like. Now, I appreciate the uh, convener talked about some of the perhaps controversial comments made uh, by Police Scotland, who as far back as March said that catching people who break the 20 mile per hour uh, zone limit would not be a priority for them. And I think they acknowledged that was not an easy or popular thing to say. They came back subsequently and said that many people, and I quote, may not understand the evidence-based decisions behind our current deployment priorities, nor accept that resources are finite. It, of course it's right that they should tackle all rule breaking on our roads, and in a perfect world they probably would. But it's equally logical that they have to deploy their resource in the hotspots where the highest levels of RTAs and fatalities take place. Dangerous and high-speed driving on the A909 or the A809, not somebody driving down Broughton Street in Edinburgh's new town at 25 miles per hour at two in the morning. We have to be realistic about this, and we have to legislate sensibly. And we considered the bill in every way possible. If I have some time, I'm happy to. Yes, indeed you do. Well, uh, Mark Russell. I wondered if Mr. Green had actually engaged with the evidence that you had from Professor Avian, Adrian Davis, which showed that although there are high numbers of people killed on rural roads, there are far greater numbers of people who are seriously injured, life-changing injuries on residential streets. We're talking about residential streets here where people are dying. That's where, that's where my friend at school died. He didn't die on an A9 road. He died on a residential street where he lived. And that's where the police need to take greater enforcement action. Jamie Green. Uh, I think the member has made his point, and I hope the police are listening to that point uh, and, and uh, reflect on that. Um, look, I, I don't think uh, that this has been an easy uh, thing to consider. I do think the committee gave it its all, though. There was nothing in the bill we did not look at. We looked at the finances of it, and I know it's not all about money. We looked at the impact on average speeds, and I think the result was neg negligible. We looked at congestion. We looked at air quality. We looked at accident reduction levels. We looked at the issue of adherence and indeed enforcement. Nothing was left out. Uh, but just because this bill did not garner sufficient support or indeed raise many questions and answering some, I would like to close on a mixed note. As I said in my opening, I don't think the government has been let off the hook on this issue. I would like to see the current process improved. I think the member was laudable in his aims and ambitions, and I hope he will command the respect of the chamber for bringing this forward. But my view is that this bill was the wrong answer to the right question. And if this government does not react to the members' concerns or to the committee's concerns, then rest assured, Mr. Ruskell, that these benches will work with him and anybody else to ensure that if there are ongoing barriers to establishing 20 mile per hour zones where they are wanted, then he will have our support for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Colin, Colin Smith to open for the Labour Party. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to open this debate on behalf of Labour and to make clear we will be voting to put children's safety first today by supporting this bill. I think it is also important to, to place on record that when some members refer to the view of the committee, that was not the view of all of the committee. It was almost a third of members dissenting very clearly from that view. I want to thank Matt Ruskell for bringing this bill forward. It has put the issue of lower speed limits on the political agenda and forced a long overdue discussion on the failures of the current approach to 20 mile per hour and delivering the benefits for far more communities. Because, President Officer, the benefits are clear and evident. Research by the, the Glasgow Centre for Population Health showed that the introduction of a 20 mile per hour speed limit in Scotland could result in up to 755 fewer casualties a year and five fewer fatalities. 
Multiple studies have shown a reduction in emissions, with research in Wales suggesting transport emissions are reduced by 12 per cent where there are 20 mile per hour limits. The benefits in reducing air pollution is why the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence recommends the introduction of 20 mile per hour limits. Research by the Department for Transport reported a statistically significant increase in active travel in response to the introduction of 20 mile per hour speed limits. And the pilot of Edinburgh's own 20 mile per hour limit showed a 7% increase in journeys taken on foot, a 5% increase in journeys taken by bike, and a 3% decrease in journeys taken by car. During stage one, the, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee heard the social, environmental and safety benefits of 20 mile per hour speed limits. For improved road safety to reduce emissions to increased levels of active travel. The case for 20 mile per hour limits in built up areas was clear. And this is not a rural versus urban issue. This is about residential areas, whether they're in a village or in a city, gaining from those benefits. So that's why this bill has strong public support, indeed the backing of over 80% of respondents in the bill's consultation. Given the strength of evidence and support, I am disappointed that a majority of committee members decided not to recommend the general principles of the bill. One of the myths against this bill are claims that it won't work because in existing 20 mile an hour areas, many people do not stick to that speed limit. It's a point that the Cabinet Secretary made. But, President Officer, that's an argument against the current ad hoc policy. It's a reason to support this bill, not to oppose it. Drivers are used to driving at 30 mile per hour, and only by making 20 miles per hour the norm will we change that culture and habit so that we become used to driving at 20 miles per hour. A national approach would help ensure that happens and, and the benefits are also shared more equally in communities. The Faculty of Public Health in Scotland raised this issue at the committee, stating that allowing each local council to pick and choose the areas that implement 20 mile per hour limits or zones risks widening health inequalities. The introduction of 20 mile an hour limits has been proven to deliver significant health benefits from safer roads to reduce pollution to increased active travel. A postcode lottery should not determine whether people get those benefits or not, and only a new national default will deliver those benefits for all. In its recommendations, the committee stated that it supports the aim of seeking to widen the implementation of 20 mile per hour zones in Scotland, with the objective of reducing death and serious injuries in roads. In reply to my question at committee, the Cabinet Secretary also said there is good and where there is good evidence 20 mile per hour should be introduced. But the reality is this won't happen under the current system. While councils may choose to introduce 20 mile per hour zones in the areas, many choose not to, even where there is clear demand and clear evidence. This piecemeal ad hoc approach has not, will not and cannot deliver the long-term cultural change that we need. The Society of Chief Officers of Transportation in Scotland told the committee, and I quote, there is a reluctance to roll out 20 mile per hour limits more widely in some local authorities. Scots also stated that local councils have made clear that simply tweaking the TRO process to reduce the financial and administrative burden of introducing a new speed limit street by street, welcome as that may be, will not deliver the change needed. We need national action and we need national leadership. Moving beyond this bill beyond stage one and agreeing the general principles would allow us to start to have that debate about what that national action should be. It would also be an opportunity to test the myths against this bill. For example, the claim that it implements a one-size-fits-all approach across the country, even when such a speed limit is not appropriate. That's simply not true. The bill would change the default speed limit for built-up areas and local authorities would still have the power to exempt roads from the default speed limit, just as they're able to introduce higher limits in some of the 30 mile an hour zones at the moment. The bill is no more a one size fits all approach than the current policy of 30 miles per hour is a one size fits all approach. Exactly. Now what is being dismissed as that one size fits all approach is actually a call for consistency to avoid confusion, encourage long term behavioural change and ensure the benefits of 20 mile an hour are felt equally across the country. Those who claim that local authorities should have to do the work to deliver 20 mile per hour street by street because that's what they want, ignore the fact many local authorities support this bill, mm -hmm. often because it would be less onerous and less expensive than the current system. Mm -hmm. City of Edinburgh Council told the committee that implementing the new speed limit in this way, as opposed to doing it independently street by street, would have more than half the cost. Another myth that would, uh, this would increase speed limit enforcement problems is simply not true. There is no evidence to suggest the enforcement problems are any different from the ones we face in existing 
30 million hour zone. That's an issue about police resources. It's an issue about police priorities. Now, if the government are truly convinced that the approach set out in the bill is not the best way to achieve the aim of moving towards a speed limit of 20 mile per hour in residential areas, we need to start to come up with alternatives because the current system is failing our communities. We need to show the same leadership in Scotland as we've seen recently in Wales, where the Welsh Government have set up a task and finish group to look at how we can achieve their aim of implementing a default speed of 20 mile per hour. In, trans in London, Transport for London are also rolling out 20 mile per hour, and London's Mayor Sadiq Khan wants that expanded beyond the centre of London. It's time for Scotland to catch up with other parts of the UK. So my challenge to the Scottish Government today is make clear Scotland will show the ambition other parts of the UK are showing. Make clear that when a child walking to school or to the local play park benefits from doing so on streets with lower speed limits, they shouldn't, decide, they shouldn't be determined which part of Scotland they live in as to whether they get those benefits. The government should establish a task force with a very clear aim of delivering 20 mile an hour in Scotland's residential areas and make clear that Scotland will become a safer place to live. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on John Finney to open for the Green Party. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, President Officer. Can I say at the outset, I I'd like to thank all my colleagues in the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee uh, for their diligent attention to this matter. And that at the end of the day, we take up different uh, um, conclusions. Um, I am disappointed at, but I absolutely accept that views are held in good faith. My intervention to the convener was not to question his role, or, but it was to say that actually what we did was we all heard the same thing. We drew different conclusions from it. And it's maybe to think why we might have drawn different conclusions from it. Because we're all shaped by our experience. And if, as others, you've had the misfortune to deal with a child casualty, for instance, that might take your perception about the importance of, or the relative importance of road signs and put it in a different category. Because my word, any cursory check of the official report will show the inordinate and ridiculous length of time we spent discussing road signs. Road signs are a factor. What actually causes people is irresponsible driver behaviour. And what we know, one of the worst causes of casualties is speed. And we know from people like uh, the Royal College of uh, Paediatricians, then when they say very simply, slower traffic makes for safer streets, which mean fewer children are killed on our roads. Now, that's a briefing that we've all had, and we've had a number of briefings. And I have to say, um, the, 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 this bill was scrutinised. People make the, the, their different views on and the different priorities. But it's also about different priorities. And an awful lot of our views and a lot of the language, anyone analysing the language will see that it's shaped on a presumption that the motor car is king. You need only walk about anywhere and whether you're going to cross a road with someone emerging from a junction, the presumption that they will have if it's a, an uncontrolled crossing is that the motor car is important. I might or may not have mentioned this in the the um, committee before, and maybe informally in the private section, but there was a great, there was a great um, Walt Disney cartoon that epitomises what a lot of underplays this, and it was called Mr. Walker, Mr. Driver, and I think Mr. Walker was a dog, and Mr. Walker was a lovely dog, and he went around, he was very friendly, and he walked everywhere and spoke to everyone, and he came up in the world, and Mr. Walker got a car, and he became Mr. Driver, and what a horrible piece of work he was, he was shaking his fist out the now, not everyone, not everyone, of course, reacts like that. But first and foremost, we must consider human beings. And the human beings I had hoped would be at the forefront of our considerations with the 755 casualties per year and the five deaths per year. These are hugely important figures. There's another issue that's been germane to this debate, and it's one that peppers a lot of discussions we have, and I'm conscious particularly that government ministers use it, and I, and I absolutely understand why, and it's the issue of central direction versus local autonomy, and I absolutely get that. The people on this benches like local government. We like local a lot. I just wonder next week when we come to discuss um, amendments to a, another piece of legend if people are going to say, absolutely, absolutely stick to the idea that central determination is inappropriate in this and what we need is local decision making. I fear not. And of course, I fear not. We can take different decisions in different things. <coughs> I want to talk about the issue of enforcement and uh, say that I was bitterly disappointed from what I heard from Police Scotland. As a former police officer, if there's a danger, 
that, um, and that this, this manifests itself in people, my constituents, your constituents, phoning the police, and the first thing they're told is we're very busy. Well, we're all very busy. But if you tell someone you're very busy, you say you're not a priority. Human beings are a priority. And uh, we must direct resources to protect life and property. That's a key function. What we heard from the police was that they have a system for prioritizing. And the system relates to deaths. Now, as someone who lends, represents a largely rural consistency, of course, there's not a village, a small town in the Highlands that hasn't been blighted by deaths of excessive speed in rural roads. But if you don't, if what shapes your priority is detecting offenders in 20 mile an hour areas and you don't seek to detect, well, that's going to skew the basis in which you formalize your priorities. So it, it was deeply disappointing, never mind some of the contradicted evidence we've, said, we've heard. Um, the issue of, uh, I'll, I'll leave it to, yes, indeed. Liam Kerr. I'm very grateful. Just on that point, the member presumably will recognise, though, that uh, for whatever reason, the police do have limited resources and do have limited time and therefore must make prioritisation decisions accordingly. John Finney. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I'll tell you what my priority would be, and I imagine if you are to say to the public what their priority would be, would be 755 casualties a year and five lives a year that could be saved. Now, of course, I've said that responsible drive behaviour is the main factor in these. And the Minister is entirely right to say that, of course, you can design out things and that some roads are more amenable to 20 mile an hour. But there are roads that have designed that way. Easter Road, which I walk every other day, um, is like that. People go at excessive speed in that. There must be there must be enforcement of the existing arrangements. And the idea that um, you know, cost is a factor, I, I really, really, everything is about priorities. It's absolutely about priorities. My colleague, uh, Mark Ruskell, has laid out a number of, of um, the organs, a considerable number of the organizations that support this, this situation. But if we really, are we really saying, are we really saying it's the number of signs that are in a rural village that's more important than actually taking steps to address, you assess a risk and you put in steps uh, in place, steps to ameliorate that risk. The a step that you, most obvious step that everyone says, the road professionals, the police accept, is speed. And the idea, the idea that we are not concentrating on addressing a situation that means that five children's lives would be saved if you put this legislation in place, I find deeply disappointing. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I call Mike Rumbles to open for the Liberal Democrats. Thank you, Presiding Officer. No one could be against a bill designed to reduce death and serious injury on our roads. And who, in particular, could be against measures that would increase child safety? On the face of it, the bill before us purports to be just such a bill. Indeed, when the bill's author, Mark Ruskell, responded to the committee's report on his bill, he said the report puts, and I quote, puts the motoring lobby ahead of child safety. I have to say that his approach and response to the committee's findings about the inadequacies of his bill seem to me to have been designed to try to deflect our criticism of his bill and pretend that some kind of motoring lobby, to use his words, has captured committee members. I'm pleased to see that he didn't today in the chamber repeat that ridiculous charge, and I contrast his response with the measured response we've just heard from my fellow committee member John Finney. Members of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee have given this bill a fair hearing. I and my Liberal Democrat colleagues want to see less accidents and we want to see safer roads across the country. But according to the evidence, the evidence I heard, this bill would deliver neither. Firstly, it is a myth that this bill would deliver a standard 20 mile an hour speed limit to replace the 30 mile an hour speed limit across the country. It doesn't. It is designed to reduce the speed limit only on C-class and unclassified roads. That's the name of the bill. In our rural communities, many people want to see the speed limits on our A and B-class roads running through our villages reduced to 20 miles an hour. This bill does not do that. And to be fair to Mark Ruskell, he doesn't pretend it does. What it does, though, is force every single road and track in our villages that are covered by street lighting to have 20 mile an hour signs erected at the junctions where they meet these through village roads. No, it misses the road safety target spectacularly. Members have had their chance. We've had two speeches from the Greens already. You've made your points. Let me make the points from my perspective 
and then I might take an intervention later. The evidence from rural local authorities like the borders, and we've heard the criticism of the borders, repeatedly said that speed in the areas that would be affected by this bill are not, are not the major cause of death and serious injury. Slow moving vehicles reversing and the like were far more of a danger. They were concerned about the need to spend scarce resources on safety measures on their rural 60 mile an hour roads where death and serious injury was far too common and I can vouch for that in Aberdeenshire. They were concerned that money they would have to spend as a result of this bill would be taken away from their road safety focus. And yes, addressing the issue of money head on, the Transport Secretary in a letter to our convener said, and I quote him, the costs associated with this bill have been significantly underestimated. And if this bill was passed, would divert resources away from existing road safety and active travel activity potentially undermining work that would be more effective, more effective at reducing casualties. When the committee said in its report, and again I quote, it is a view of the, that the estimated costs and savings associated with the bill proposals are not robust. We were being polite. When in committee I asked Mark Ruskell how he estimated his costs in the financial memorandum accompanying the bill, he said that he looked at Angus Council and simply extrapolated from there. Well, that simply isn't good enough. And many of us, and many, sorry, who gave us evidence, estimated the costs of his bill at many millions more than he did. No. Now, Edinburgh Council, I have only got six minutes. Now, Edinburgh Council have achieved all that they wish to achieve with their 20 mile an hour zones. And they've done this under the current legislation. However, if this bill is passed, they would have to spend another million pounds. You don't like hearing this, but I'm going to say it. It's the evidence we received. They would spend another million pounds taking down 20 mile an hour repeater signs. Yes, taking down, it'd be better if you listened actually. Taking down 20 mile an hour signs to comply with the law. Perversely, in my view, they are in favor of the bill because they think, and we heard this from them, that if it were passed, they would get this funding from the Scottish government. And what a waste of public money this would be, and every local authority who has already pursued 20 mile an hour zones will be faced with a bill in taking down their 20, 20 mile an hour repeater signs too. If I had more time, I would love to take interventions. What is con... I have heard the evidence. Many people in this chamber did not sit through all the evidence sessions that we sat through in committee. What has convinced me, however, that this bill is not necessary is the evidence from the Transport Secretary when he told the committee that he already had the power to change the speed limits through regulations. He does. If he thought that this was the right thing to do, he would do it. He does not think that this is the right thing to do, and I agree with him. I'll say that again. I agree with the Transport Minister, and I believe that for road safety, this bill is actually counterproductive. Lastly, I would gently say to Mark Ruskell that what we have all done on the committee is listen carefully, and I would like other people to listen carefully, to all the evidence presented to us and use, you know, to use an advertising slogan, we found that this bill doesn't do what it says on the tin, and it should not be supported at decision time. Thank you, and that concludes our opening speeches. We turn to the open part of the debate, and I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Liam Kerr. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, presiding officer. And uh, I, I rise to speak as someone who signed uh, uh, support for the proposal for this bill, but having heard the evidence has come to uh, a disappointing conclusion. Disappointing for me, as it will be disappointing for others. But let's start about the fundamental thesis behind all this uh, and, and a matter on which we will undoubtedly agree. There's EU research that says that a human car collision at 20 miles an hour has a 10% probability of fatality. At 30 miles an hour, it rises to 40% probability. I mean, you get to 50 miles an hour, it is 100% probability. And you can draw the line. So increasing speed in a collision causes deaths. And actually, these figures are for an adult being hit, 
by a vehicle. A child being hit by a vehicle, I don't have equivalent numbers for, but I don't think we should doubt for a single second that the effects will be substantially more severe. So I think we will have a shared view, and I'm sure Mike Rumbles will agree with this, that speed kills. So the question is not so much as to whether there is a problem waiting to be solved, and which we should turn our attention to. Uh, the question is really just much more uh, about how we should do it. Oh, I'll give some other numbers, by the way. A 1% increase in speed it results in a 4% increase in fatal accidents. That's from other research. So the relationship between speed and the outcome from accidents uh, is clear, unambiguous, and I think the, the, the work of the committee absolutely recognise that. Um, we've got to be careful about what the bill does. I, I, I think there's a danger of our misleading ourselves about what the bill does, because I haven't, I confess, looked at the detail of what the Welsh are proposing to do. I heard uh, the member in charge, whose every effort on this I utterly commend, without reservation, I have to say, um, that, that, that they are changing the national speed limit. But of course, this bill doesn't do that. Um, what it does do is address simply restricted roads. And I must say, I'd never really heard of restricted roads, what they were, it's not a distinction, despite having been transport minister previously, uh, of which I was aware. Mike Rumbles uh, referred to it uh, essentially being uh, a road that is not an A road or a B road and has uh, uh, lampposts no more than 185 metres apart. That's a restricted road. And of course, that properly covers most of the roads in most of our towns and villages where pedestrians, and young pedestrians in particular, are likely to be found. But of course, yes, I will. John Finney. Thank you. I'm very grateful to the member taking a brief intervention on this point. Would you say it's therefore, given that the description is given, it's astonishing that people say they don't know the length of the, the total length of these roads? including the Cabinet Secretary. Um, Stuart Stevenson. Um, well, I, if I can just find the... Uh, oh, here we are. At paragraph uh, 140 in uh, the committee's report, it said that 21% of local authorities have identified the roads they'd wish to sit to attend to and those in which they would wish to retain 30. 29% they have the asset data to allow roads to be uh, identify. There's certainly a lot of ignorance out there about the state of our roads. And I absolutely accept that that is a driver to do something about that. Absolutely and unambiguously accept. Um, it is disappointing that the percentages are as low as we report uh, at paragraph uh, 140 in the, 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 the committee's report because ignorance is not a good basis for policy making and action on the ground. I congratulate uh, urban areas uh, in particular like Edinburgh who've uh, invested the time, the effort and made the difference. It is worth of course reminding ourselves about the evidence we got um, that the introduction of a 20 mile uh, zone where previously it was 30 only appears to uh, give us about a one mile an hour reduction in average speed. But averages are not the whole story, of course. The real problem, uh, I have to say, is the problem of what those who are breaking the law are doing in a 20 compared to a 30. I don't think we got evidence that answered that question, but I think we probably instinctively, and I instinctively believe, that someone who's going to break the law will break the law anyway. So the question of enforcement is one which we, we shouldn't put uh, simply to one side. I will, yes, if the member... Jamie Green. I, I'm, I'm listening with careful interest to my colleague on the committee, but, uh, and for my benefit, uh, you started off saying you were a proposer and a proponent of the concept of the bill. For me, I'd be really interested in, in learning from your point of view, what was the primary thing that made you change your mind to the position that you resulted in? Because I think that would be quite helpful. Stuart Stevenson. Well, I was just about to come to that because it's a perfectly proper question that I should be asked given my starting point in the debate and, and my ending point. And it is worth saying my political colleagues who speak from these benches will give different views on the subject, which I think is in the interests of balance. No, ultimately, I, th I think I came to the conclusion, driven by the evidence, this wasn't the most straightforward way of achieving the objectives that the bill set out for itself. Um, 
it might be easier to do it simply by changing the speed limit. Because there are many villages, first of all, let's say, who have streets which actually don't have street lighting. So actually, strictly speaking, are not caught by the, 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 the restricted road. Mr Chapman and myself could probably identify one or two. Members yes. in his last minute. Uh, the members in his last minute. All right. Minute. Sorry, presiding officer. Um, I did want to be helpful. Uh, but, uh, and equally, there are many towns and villages where there is an A or B road goes through. And it would be appropriate to consider that for a 20. So I think that uh, this is a worthy, worthy attempt. Uh, to address this particular issue, but it falls short in terms of its capability of implementation and its cost of implementation. Um, I went through a little village close to me and I counted you would need 80 signs in that village. So I think we've got to not take the pressure off government and the minister to find a way. I just am not persuaded by the evidence that this is the way. And I do so with very grave disappointment because I support the objectives the member sought. Liam Kerr, followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> I'm pleased to be given the opportunity to speak today, um, not as a committee member, uh, but as an advanced driver of 26 years who used to put in around 40,000 uh, road miles a year through most UK towns and cities. And also as a commuting and road and racing cyclist who believes strongly in active travel and the need to get more people cycling, uh, particularly on urban roads. Now, I say that at the outset because I do want to recognise the work that Mark Ruskell has put into this. I believe he's asking the right questions. He's seeking practical measures which could improve air quality, encourage active travel, reduce pollution and reduce accidents. And I think that's the right thing to be doing. But I don't think this bill will achieve it. For example, if you've got everybody driving at 20 miles an hour, then yes, of course, the accidents that will still happen are less serious than at greater speeds. But despite the member's response to my intervention, I just don't think, well, no, I know that won't happen. I saw the committee's conclusion that compliance with 20 mile per hour limits is poor. And that actually supports some evidence from a transport research laboratory from several years ago which found that 20 mile an hour limits reduce average speed by 0.9 miles an hour. Now, the first area to introduce a blanket 20 mile an hour limit was Islington, and it cut the speed of 85%, so not even all of the traffic, by one mile an hour, on average. So the evidence, to my mind, suggests that a mandatory 20 mile an hour speed limit would not significantly reduce speed, and I'm not convinced it is right to mandate a cost of 10 million onto our local authorities for a possible return of one mile an hour. Yes. Mark Ruskell. One million across the whole of Scotland. But would the member not recognise, because there has been a lot of confusion in the committee, that an average speed is an average, and that there has been much greater reduction of speed, particularly on higher speed roads, when 20 mile an hour has been introduced. You might be looking at eight, nine, 10 miles an hour reduction in speed on those higher speed roads. That's what the evidence is showing. Liam the average Kerr. is the um, I, I don't actually accept that that will happen across the board, but I, I point the member to Stuart Stevenson's point about the average speed, which I think was well made in terms of we need to look at, when you average it out, you get a certain answer, but we need to understand what's happening to the people who are not complying. And it's a point I'll come back to shortly, if I may, uh, because I'm not convinced a 20 mile an hour limit materially impacts safety either and there's a department for transport study which would suggest that and ironically there's a study from york which suggests that 20 mile an hour limits could be increasing rather than reducing the risk because it lulls pedestrians into a false sense of security and i think that understanding of behavior is an important one because it applies equally to drivers if you remove the need for people to consciously drive you reduce their attention. If you impose an arbitrary limit on a straight, clear urban artery on a sunny day with minimal traffic, drivers glaze over, or as happens now with blanket prohibitions which take no account of prevailing conditions, they simply ignore it. Yeah. Mark Ruskell. I, I, I just, it, it's just incredible that the member hasn't engaged with the evidence. The four-year DFT report found no evidence for the claims that he's making. Liam Kerr. I absolutely do engage with the evidence, and I say this as a driver. The problem is we cannot divorce this from the reality of what is going on outside and what will happen. Uh, research suggests, Mr Ruskell, that drivers are using clues from the environment around them to judge 
appropriate speeds. Good drivers know that a limit is just that. It's a limit, not a target. And we should be ensuring, as a practical solution, that drivers are trained to judge the appropriate speed, not delegate responsibility to an arbitrary yet mandated limit. And similarly, where limits do not match the environment or prevailing conditions, uncertainty and confusion are generated, which will distract from appropriate decision making. On the contrary, a speed limit which matches the road environment, promotes self-compliance and confidence in the system, removes the need for enforcement. And would it be enforced? Well, no. I found the evidence uh, of Chief Superintendent Carl to the committee persuasive when he said he would target limited resources towards where the majority of casualties take place. And I, I think the committee heard that mobile camera units are not even calibrated for 20 mile an hour. And John Finney's right. What causes casualties? I'm very short on time. Uh, yeah, uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, that was initially told to the committee and subsequently corrected. Subsequently corrected. Um, Liam Kerr, I can very allow you some extra member. time. Thank you, presiding officer. But I, I want to make the point, John Finney's right. What causes casualties, to use his words, is irresponsible driver behaviour. But the point, actually going back to Stuart Stevenson's uh, presentation, is... It is irresponsible. I think a speed limit will be breached by those drivers, whatever happens. Uh, will there be an increase to safety of cyclists? I just don't believe there will. Even if you put a 20 mile an hour limit on the Great Western Road in Aberdeen, you still won't get my wife and kid on it. Spend the 10 million that I think the committee heard about on segregated bike lanes, and then we'll start talking. So I think the solution, the, the way to increase road safety, to remove decisions on adherence to road laws and to the issue of enforcement is targeted 20 mile an hour zones enforced by appropriate measures such as speed bumps and road designs determined by those who know a community's roads best the people living there key stakeholders the local authority and restricted to locations and times where the need for a 20 mile an hour zone is obvious and any 20 mile an hour zone must be self-enforcing by ensuring that the signposting, the features and the traffic calming measures make sense to the road users. So instead of imposing restrictions on all drivers to catch the careless, the uncaring, the irresponsible, build in segregated design features for enhanced pedestrian and cycling safety. So look, presiding officer, the bill's fundamental premise of a blanket 20 mile an hour limit would fail to achieve its stated aims in my view, and there are better ways to achieve that behavior change. And for that reason, I won't be supporting the principles of this bill at decision time. John Mason, followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and I'm very pleased to speak uh, in this debate, having been on the REC Committee as we took evidence from Mark Ruskell, uh, from the government and from many others. And I think the first thing I want to stress is that there was widespread agreement, as others have said, that 20 miles per hour is better than 30 miles per hour in residential areas. Clearly, a child or an elderly person being hit by a vehicle at 20 is going to be much less seriously hurt than if it had been at 30. And that is particularly important to me as there are more accidents in deprived areas such as parts of my constituency. The Glasgow Centre for Population Health, which is based in Bridgeton in my constituency, argues that there would be a significant positive health impact specifically in reducing the number and severity of road traffic casualties. Uh, they also say, um, that in refer referring to both South Central Edinburgh and the permanent scheme in Bristol, a significant reduction in road traffic casualties and accidents are potentially possible. And nevertheless, the introduction of 20 mile per hour limits in South Central Edinburgh and Bristol led to reductions in average speed, and in the case of Bristol, significant casualty reductions. So the disagreement on the committee was not where we wanted to get to, but was how to get there. Edinburgh already has 80% of its roads at 20, so clearly it can be done under the present system. However, Edinburgh itself said that the bill would be helpful as it would save other councils having to go through the lengthy and expensive route that they had had to go down. In Glasgow, the City Council is supporting the bill. They see it as simpler and a less expensive way of achieving a wider rollout of 20 mile per hour zones. And I think there's a strong argument that having a national approach would provide consistency and is more likely to change public perception. It is in people's minds now that 30 is the norm or the default, 
and we need to change that thinking so that 20 becomes the norm. However, I do accept there are arguments against the bill, including, for example, there is some uncertainty as to exactly which roads are restricted and which are not. Personally, I question whether this uncertainty really affects a huge volume of roads. Another argument against is the questions over the robustness of the financial memorandum. However, having been in this place for about eight years, I think, frankly, you could say that about most financial memorandum. And again, I do not think this is a killer point for the bill. Perhaps more of a real challenge, as I see it, is the potential multiplication of road signs. If every A and B road was to remain at 30, while every restricted road was to be 20, it would mean uh, speed signs on virtually every street corner. However, again, the counter-argument to that is that Edinburgh has avoided that to some extent by making wider areas 20. So not just the restricted roads, but in fact part of the A1 is 20 as well. Therefore, councils would still have the power to reduce A and B roads to 20, thus giving more of a zonal approach and building on the bill's focus on the exact classification of certain roads. On the subject of signage and cost, one big uncertainty has been around repeater signs. Currently, repeater, sign, repeater 30 signs are not allowed in a 30 zone, although they are required uh, for 20 and 40 sections within cities. If the bill went through and the rules were not changed, then it would switch to 20 repeater signs not being allowed uh, while 30 and 40 would be required. And the cost in the financial memorandum includes something between one and two million to remove existing 20 repeater signs. I think this was a point there was quite a lot of agreement on the committee that really this system maybe look, needs looking at be, being reviewed. And I think the cabinet secretary said he would be prepared to do that. I've certainly got roads uh, at 30 in my constituency. Uh, some members may know Clyde Gateway, which is a relatively new dual carriageway, which by Liam Kerr's argument should probably be a 40 road. It feels like a 40 road, but it is a 30. There is complaints about speeding and the council is not allowed to put up repeater signs. So I think there is an issue there quite apart from the bill. On the question of impact on the, envi on the environmental impact of the bill, I reckon the jury is still out. We heard evidence that slowing traffic down could cause some engines to perform less efficiently, whereas we also heard evidence that some engines do perform well at lower speeds, and if traffic flow becomes smoother, that would be very positive too. Uh, the Glasgow Centre for Population Health said, the health impacts on air pollution of this type of speed limit reduction has not been estimated due to data constraints. Enforcement is another key issue, and there did appear to be some misreporting in the media uh, of evidence we had received. I think uh, Liam Kerr again had picked up on that. The police seem clear that they feel their emphasis should be on faster roads outside towns where there is a 60 mile per hour limit and any crash is more likely to lead to deaths. So already there may be a question over whether more emphasis should be on tackling speed in residential areas, whether the speed limit is 30 or 20. I don't think that affects the actual argument. Now I have to say, I think one slightly ironic uh, part of this bill is that uh, we often think of the Greens as the party of localism and decentralization. However, in this case, they appear to be the party of centralization, while the, argument is arguing for, uh, the government is arguing for local authority responsibility to remain unchanged. So in conclusion, presiding officer, uh, I, I was one of the three who voted to support the bill. As the committee prepared its report, I am still not persuaded to oppose the bill, despite the strong government arguments against it. I have said I do, as I've said, I do recognise there are arguments on both sides, and there is broad agreement that we should be moving towards a wider use of 20 mile per hour limits. So I will be abstaining at decision time today, which probably will keep few people entirely happy. But hopefully over time, as things progress, we will see something else happening in future. Thank you. called Daniel Johnson to be followed by Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to begin uh, by thank you, thanking Mark Ruskell for bringing this bill forward and indeed for doing the hard and diligent work that I know has gone into this. It's no mean feat bringing forward a member's bill as I know as I'm attempting to do the same thing. And this is a, undoubtedly a worthy and important issue and, and one which uh, unfortunately looks like will not prevail today and we are losing the opportunity for Scotland to be again at the forefront of leading change. And in the end of the day, I fear that we will be returning to this issue, but as a laggard. And that's the reality of this, because this is important. And I, I speak as much uh, as an MSP for Edinburgh Southern, which was where the initial trial in Edinburgh took place, but also as an apparent 
as an, an Edinburgh resident because it is unequivocal. If we reduce traffic speeds, we will save injuries and we will save lives. Approximately 900 children were injured on our roads in 2017. And the reality is, is that 20 miles an hour makes them seven times less likely to, uh, to, to uh, be injured if they are hit. And indeed, where we have seen 20 mile an hour uh, limits introduced in places like Hull and in London, we have seen drops by as much as a uh half. -huh. That is change that I think is worth having and worth making the effort. And no, it is not going to be easy. And yes, there are costs. But if it saves lives, if it saves injuries, then I think it's worth doing. And that is the decision that members will be having to contemplate at decision time, whether those lives and those injuries are worth saving. So that's why I think it's important. And my experience here in Edinburgh is that this is something that's achievable. Now, I, I've had to defend this. This is something where personally I've had to take some small amount of leadership and defend this policy which was introduced by the Labour SNP coalition in the last council. Because people said it's unnecessary, it's inconvenient. I don't like driving at 20 miles an hour. Or my favourite was, my car doesn't go at 20 miles an hour. <laughs> All cars go at 10 miles an hour. I've had to stop myself from giving them driving instruction. I haven't gone that far. But this is something that is worth having. And indeed, it is something that is enforced. I have been out with the local police as we have stopped cars going in excess of the 20 mile an hour and just one road over to the one that I live in. And what we've experienced in Edinburgh's average speed is down. And indeed, local support for this initiative is up. And we've seen already a drop in casualties as a result of this. And that is something that I think the whole of Scotland should enjoy. And even my personal experience as a driver, I know my car is more fuel efficient since the introduction of that. I've seen that on the trip computer. I find driving calmer, frankly, because traffic speeds are down. But above all else, our roads, I believe, in Edinburgh are a better place for all road users, whether you are walking, cycling, or indeed driving. So I believe this is a good proposal. And indeed, I think it is notable that Edinburgh Council says that the costs that they incurred from introducing would have been halved under this. So yes, there are costs, and, and perhaps this financial memorandum is not 100% accurate. And as Mr. Mason points out, what financial memorandums are, but it would make it cheaper to introduce. Now, there's been a degree of inconsistency, I believe, in some of the arguments that have been made against this. On the one hand, we've heard uh, arguments about compliance. On the other hand, we've had arguments about one size fits all. But surely, a consistent approach to the application of our road rules would drive up adherence to them. I mean, are people really arguing that we should have localized highway codes in our different towns and villages? That is a nonsense. We have a single highway code on our roads because by having a single consistent set of rules is how we make sure that people follow them because they know what the expectations are. After all, in 1861, when the first speed limit was introduced, it was 10 miles an hour. You don't hear people arguing for that now, nor the red flag bearer that had to be, precede the driver as he drove down the road. These things are a matter of habit and culture, and habits and culture can be changed. And indeed, it's our responsibility to seek to change those habits and those cultures when we believe that there are benefits for doing so. And I think this is one of those uh, situations. And indeed, on the enforcement point, greater consistency will not make it, only make it easier, but frankly, if this is a priority, we will enforce it. And can I make one small point? This is a matter that's difficult for police, but if you remove 700 officers from local divisions, what do you expect? Not just enforcing this speed limit, but frankly, the existing ones. If this was a priority, we'll make it happen. Because frankly, this comes down to leadership. And I understand there are mixed views. There are always cautious voices when it comes to change. And people can be incredibly defensive when it comes to the way that they use their cars and they go about their local communities. I understand that. But I believe there is a need for change. And I believe it is incumbent on us to stand up and make the, the arguments for change. And ultimately, I believe that this is a proposal that would make people safer, safer and would save lives. And for those reasons, I would urge all members to think on their consciences and ultimately vote for this at decision time tonight. Thank you. Uh, the last speaker in the open debate is Claire Adamson. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I would like to put on record my support and um, I thank Sir Mark Ruskell for bringing this very important issue to the um, fore in this Member's Bill. I would also like to thank the committee members of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee for their diligence and deliberations as um, they went through the Stage 1 process. Presiding Officer, as a former North Lanarkshire Councillor and as such a member of the Scottish Action Prevention Council and convener of the Cross Party Group on Accident Prevention and Safety Awareness, I am and continue to be a full supporter of appropriate 20 mile an hour limits in Scotland. And I was very keen to support um, the, um, and be a signatory to the proposed bill when Mark Rus Ruskell first brought it to um, uh, our attention. I've listened and I've read the evidence and the stage one report, and I accept that it's unlikely that the bill will progress today, but I do wish to make comment on a number of key areas. I have in front of me notice of North Lancashire Council entry and award-winning entry in Prince Michael International Awards um, uh, on road safety. Um, they was in, and I'll, I'll just read out the entry, um, which explains it all. So North Lancashire Council's 2020 Highway Engineering Improvement 2005 winner. North Lancashire Council believes that speed reduction will result in casualty reduction. It introduced a 20 mile an hour speed limit in every residential area in North Lancashire in 2001-2002 uh, at a cost of £360,000. North Lancashire Council is still the only authority to have introduced an advisory 20 mile an hour measure throughout its full area as part of an integrated programme of public education, 20 plenties campaign, and increased public acceptability of this speed reduction measure. And I have in front of me the statistics on road traffic accidents since 1995 to the present day, uh, 2017. And the year following that introduction, North Lanarkshire saw its biggest percentage reduction in road traffic accidents on record in that period, 15% reduction 144 fewer road traffic accidents in that time. It's continued to approve in line with the other road traffic um, accident statistics across Scotland. I commend the government for the work they have done in encouraging safer roads. But this brought home to me just how much of an impact 20s Plenty can have in a community. And while I appreciate that was a local decision made for local reasons, I still believe that this could be a um, benefit to the whole of Scotland. Um, what um, I have in front of me is um, a book. Um, I know we're not supposed to use props, but this is Rospas, Scotland's Big Book of Accident Prevention. And I want to read out a couple of facts from this book. Um, uh, the first one, because we have talked about money and the cost of this quite a lot today. But in Scotland, accidents cost society more than 12.4 billion per annum, of which a &E attendances cost the NHS 1.48 billion pounds per year. And this book, as well as looking at the cost of, a road, of a, an accident or a fatality in Scotland, also looks at the wider societal costs, the loss of income, the loss to the economy, and what might happen in, in when someone has a debilitating injury that, they, that will lead to um, intervention for the rest of their life. So it's really important. And the other one I want to read out is children of parents who have never worked or are long term unemployed are 20 times more likely to die as pedestrians than children of parents in higher managerial or professional occupations. 20 times more likely to die as pedestrians. And this issue for me is absolutely a social justice issue. Reducing accidents, making our, our um, society uh, safer for children is as much to do with tackling poverty and societal inequality as um, PEF funding in schools, as other interventions, early years interventions we are doing. It is absolutely crucial. We often say, and it's been mentioned today, we want Scotland to be the best place in the world to grow up. Well, if we do, we have to take accident prevention more seriously. And as I said, I've said it in the chamber already on several occasions in the last few weeks, but I'm delighted that the, if the government is looking to uh, embed the UNCRC into our legislation, which is a specific area on accident prevention. So for me, this is always and will continue to be a social justice issue that we cannot ignore. 
And so as we go forward today, as I said, it's unlikely the bill will go forward today, but I have to say that um, North Lanarkshire introduced this in 20, 2001, nearly as long as the, the life of this parliament, and yet still some local authorities are dragging their heels, and I'm putting my faith in the government today, in our coll colleagues in COSLA, on everyone who has supported the principle of 20 mile an hour zones, to work with them going forward to encourage our local authorities to look to what they can do in their local areas and make real progress in this area because we've had warm words for far too long and it is time we do this. My final moments, presiding officer, can we just think about, it's not just about the signage, there are lots of things coming our way in terms of the fourth industrial revolution about black box technology and modified signs, um, uh, reporting back of, of what can happen. And at one point there was going to be a digital map of Scotland and all of our streets and what, what, what the, the limits would be in those areas that could be linked in to this. So it's not just about police enforcement, our insurance companies surely will be interested in this too. So thank you, presiding officer. Now move to the closing speeches and I call Claudia Beamish for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Yesterday I went outside our parliament to meet with demonstrators from across the country who understand the significance of this bill. Friend of the Earth, Cycling UK, Pedal on Parliament, Spokes Lothian, Go Bike and Twenties Plenty have joined forces to organise that demonstration outside uh, after, the, after the committee uh, failed to recommend its passage claiming that one size fits all is not appropriate. Dissenting MSPs, John Finney, Colin Smith and John Mason, as we've heard, rejected this conclusion, pointing out that the current patchwork of different speed limits was confusing to motorists. And today, Daniel Johnson has stated that he has seen the effects of 20 miles an hour in his constituency and believes it's achievable. It's something he thinks that all of Scotland should enjoy. Why doesn't the Scottish Government Transport Minister, or indeed the majority of the REC Committee, grasp the importance of this change, of which so many councils are in support, as we heard from Mark Ruskell earlier? I sat in on two of the committee sessions and found the evidence for Mark Ruskell's bill compelling. The consistency of approach would be similar for a 20 mile an hour speed limit, surely, as for a 30, 30 mile an hour um, default. Uh, but this is actually about residential living streets. And as Colin Smith said, only a national default will bring the benefits to all. It is sad that there weren't more MSPs out at the demonstration to listen yesterday. To see 60 demonstrators place chairs outside our parliament, one for every life that could have been saved, each one representing, as they said, a life interrupted. For this reason alone, we should be supporting the bill at stage one as a parliament. Sally Hinchcliffe of Pedal on Parliament, a resident of Dumfries, stated that this bill would succeed in, I quote, eliminating the postcode lottery of safer streets for children walking or cycling. And I agree. As a city cyclist myself, I'm keenly aware of the speed of cars, vans and lorries, and I'm clear that the evidence of 20 miles an hour as a default would encourage more citizens to take up active travel, whether walking or cycling. And it is frankly a no-brainer. A shift to active travel would of course mean less vehicles on our roads and slower traffic makes for safer streets, as John Finney said, the Royal College of Pediatricians in Scotland stated. Is the car still king? Do the desires of motorists to go that bit faster still count for more than the increased risk of a 30 mile an hour limit causing more serious injury and death to vulnerable road users? Surely not. And what of air quality? It is frankly shameful that Scotland has been in contravention of the EU air pollution standards and air pollution causes about 2,500 early deaths a year here. It isn't only the actual deaths but the effects of air pollution on vulnerable people with chronic lung conditions and there is increasing evidence also about the effects on children's health and now research into cancer in children on, on, and on, on mental health as well in children and also evidence about the contribution of air pollution to the development of Alzheimer's in older people. Surely any measure which is proven to lower air pollution should be given serious further consideration and not rejected at stage one. There is also evidence that more deprived communities are more affected by road traffic accidents. Analysis by Sustrans found that children in 
Scotland's poorest areas are nearly three times more likely to be injured by road traffic. Surely it cannot be right that we fail to address this when we have this opportunity. And it is clear that 20 miles an hour around our schools isn't enough because many injuries, as I heard in the committee, occur in the residential streets beyond these limits. Daniel Johnson stressed that habits and culture of drivers can be changed. And these concerns, as Colin Smith said, are not only restricted to our cities. Large villages and small towns are impacted by the range of issues which Mark Ruskell's bill would contribute to addressing. Tony Hancock, not the Tony Hancock, but another Tony Hancock, Vice Chair of the Royal Borough of Loch Maben District, Coun District Council, dis sorry, Community Council, told me recently, we have been trying to get a 20 mile limit restriction on Loch Maben High Street for the past 10 years. Speed monitoring by the council has shown that up to 800 vehicles per day are exceeding the 30 mile an hour limit. Loch Maben has an unusually wide high street and an aging population for whom crossing the road can be hazardous. We also, I don't think I've got time, I'm sorry. I can, I, I I can allow you the time, Mr. Commissioner. I'm sorry, do I have time? Yes, I can allow you the time. I don't know how much I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can, Stuart Stevenson. <laughs> can the member confirm that the road through Loch Maben is an A road? and therefore not covered by this bill? Claudia Beamish. Not all of them are, no, by any means, in Loch Maben, no. Um, so it has an unusually wide high street, as I say. There's a primary school nearby, which is accessed from the high street. And this is the point I'm making, that actually it's Excuse me, Miss Beamish. It's Would Mr. Rumbles, Mr. Stevenson, stop yelling at each other along the chairs, please. Thank it you. is actually important, um, presiding officer, that the, that the other parts of Loch Maiden, where the primary school is and other places, is where they want the 20 mile an hour limit as well. And uh, th they have said, would I vote for this today, which I certainly will. Yes, Loch Maiden and other villages can rely on the support of Scottish Labour and for, for Mark's bill. And as Friends of the Earth have reminded us, the measures in the bill would contribute to tackling the climate emergency as well by tackling the transport emissions. And that is a very important issue as well. Very recently, I hear from the City of London, the corporation will reduce the speed limit on the square mile to 15 miles an hour, subject to government approval. It follows notable reductions in deaths and serious injuries on the roads in the region after the 20 mile an hour limit was introduced. And that is seen as a good reason to bring it down further. <clears throat> and I quote from the corporation that it will make the streets more attractive places to walk, cycle and spend time. How depressing that we appear to be falling behind and having to fall back on a default task force, if that's agreed by the minister today, or, or, or some vague and frankly rather weak waffle by the Scottish government minister. London has been consulting on 20 miles an hour default. Wales is doing the same. And Europe, let's face it, has 30 kilometers an hour, which is well below our 30 miles an hour already as a default. Making roads and, and living areas safer and more agreeable is what this bill would make a significant contribution to, along with a whole range of other issues. Scottish Labour says, let's support Mark Ruskell's bill even at this late stage. We need national action and national leadership. Can I remind all members to always refer to fellow members with their full names, please? And uh, I call Peter Chapman for around seven minutes. I thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, uh, I would like to thank the committee clerks for, those, for helping us draft this report and all those who provided evidence to the committee. And of course, to Mark Ruskell for bringing the bill forward. We have a, had a good debate today, I would say, and I, I want to open my uh, statement today by saying that safer roads are obviously something we all support, both on the committee and, and I'm sure right across Parliament. That has never been in question. We want everyone to be as safe as possible when they get in their car, jump on their bike or walk to school or work. And as a committee, that is why we supported the aim of seeking to widen the, widen the implementation of 20 mile an hour zones in Scotland where appropriate, with the objective of reducing deaths and serious injuries on our roads and encouraging more people to cycle and walk. However, the committee had to decide if we agreed with the bill's proposal of introducing a default 20 mile an hour speed limit on all restricted roads in Scotland, and this we could not accept. 
And I believe it was a bold decision, but the right decision by the committee to vote against this proposal. But the evidence to support it was simply not there. And that is clearly reflected in the report. It became obvious throughout our productive and informative evidence sessions that a blanket one-size-fits-all approach is not appropriate for Scotland. And during that evidence and during this debate, we have heard that a simple 20 miles per hour speed limit has a very limited impact on the actual speeds on the ground. Design features on the road are equally or maybe even more important to lowering speeds. Self-enforcing roads are what we need. We also heard that Police Scotland do not monitor or prioritise the enforcing of 20 miles per hour limits. And as a result, real-time speed reductions are only around one miles per hour lower as a result of a 20 mile per hour limit. And I would argue that that is not very significant. I will. John Finney. I am grateful for the member taking intervention on that point. And I, and I know there was conflicting evidence about uh, speed limits, but would he acknowledge that there was unequivocal evidence about the implications of a child being hit by a vehicle and any potential to reduce the, the speed limit uh, the, the, at impact, however modest, is to be welcome? Peter Chapman. Yeah, I agree. It is, it is to be welcome. And I have already said it's to be welcome. But we need to do this in the right places. I think the, the, the problem ha we have, or I have, is that this is proposed right across Scotland, and I don't agree with that. And we also heard today that, uh, and Mike Rumble also said, and I agree with him, that where resources are limited, and let's be honest, resources are always limited, this bill could and would divert resources away from other measures which could have a far bigger impact on road safety. And that is very re relevant, and certainly in rural areas in my part of Aberdeenshire. And some say that this would be good for air quality. Uh, John Mason rightly said that the evidence we had, the effect would be very limited. And, and, and you know, some say it would be slightly better. Others gave us ev evidence to say it would be slightly worse. So very much inconclusive. So I don't agree with Claudia Beamish when she says there will be a big impact and a big improvement on air quality. Now, as a committee, we were able to agree that the existing legislative processes that enable local authorities to implement 20 mile an hour speed limits should be more straightforward and easier to implement. We therefore welcome the Scottish Government's current exercise to consider ways this can be done. And I would ask the Cabinet Secretary in closing to make comment on how this work is pro progressing. Now, a case-by-case -case approach, I believe, is the best way to implement changes to the speed limit. Local authorities should be able to decide where a 20 mile per hour limit is appropriate. Let the local councillors decide rather than be dictated to from above. What is abundantly clear and has been for many years to me as an Aberdeenshire MSP that in my part of the world, by far the most accidents causing fatalities or serious injury happen on rural roads. A prime example is the A947 from Aberdeen to Banff where serious and fatal accidents are 60% higher than the national average. The A952 from Ellen to Fraserburgh and the A90 Aberdeen to Peterhead both have similar horrendously bad rates. The sad fact is there are serious accidents on these roads almost every week. I want to see infrastructure and police time and resources invested into these sort of roads. The message from the Scottish Borders Council was very much the same saying that the bill would have a detrimental financial impact and it was unlikely to have any impact on the accidents in its largely rural areas. I therefore disagree with Colin Smith. There is indeed a difference between rural and urban areas as far as this argument is concerned. During our evidence sessions, the financial impact of implementing, uh, implementing a blanket 20 mile an hour limit was unclear and we considered that the financial memorandum was not robust. Presiding officer, it is clear that although there is merit in what this bill is trying to achieve, its general principles of a one-size-fits-all, top-down approach is not the way forward, and I will not be supporting this bill. I call Michael Matheson. I can allow you around nine minutes, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President uh, Officer. I'm, I've listened very carefully to the contributions this afternoon. I'm very grateful to all members who have 
made contributions on this important issue. And I, uh, again, want to reiterate my recognition of the work that has been undertaken by Mark Rusco on this issue and the debate which it has stimulated around the whole issue of 20 mile an hour zones uh, and 20, the 20 mile per hour uh, limit. Uh, there are uh, two important issues which I uh, set out at the, my opening remarks, uh, sign officer. One is, uh, are 20 mile an hour uh, zones and limits uh, the right thing to do in the right place? Yes, they are. Um, is what is set out in this bill the right way to go about it? I don't believe they are. Um, John Mason, I believe, uh, summed up the debate very well when he stated that it's not so much about uh, where we want to get to, it's about how we want to actually get there, uh, which I think is particularly important. I also think it's important from my perspective to put on the record that uh, those of us who might not agree uh, with the proposals which are set out in this bill in no way should be interpreted as though we don't care about the safety of children, that we don't care about speeding in our local streets and that we don't care about safety on our roads. Nothing could be further from the truth. And for some, and in particular, Mark Rusko and his contribution suggested that if we aren't supporting his bill in some way, we are doing nothing about this particular issue, which again is factually incorrect and I'm afraid is not a reflection of what's happening. I'll give way to Alison Johnson. Alison Johnson. Um, the latest Transport Scotland statistics tell us that serious accidents involving uh, children walking and cycling have increased, adult pedestrian deaths have increased, there's been a marked increase in adult cyclists involved in serious accidents. Um, so things are going in the wrong direction. Uh, what I'm trying to understand, Cabinet Secretary, is your investment in walking and cycling is really pitiful, 3% of a huge budget. Um, you have never suggested you're interested in presumed liability. You don't like my colleague's proposal, so are you suggesting you're just going to leave this to chance? What is it that you're going to do? Michael Matheson. You, General, so it's that type of contribution that doesn't take this debate forward in trying to have a serious, rational discussion about what is the best way in which to go about it. I set out the very fact that we have the road safety framework 2020 that's taken forward a whole suite of measures to tackle issues around road safety. And that's why we'll continue to pursue that with the funding which we're investing within it as well. And as an aside on the issue of the pitiful amount apparently we're putting in to, uh, into active travel, the budget which we have doubled from £39 million to some £80 million, I don't think is a reflection of a government that is not committed to this agenda. But I do take exception, sign officer, to, for anyone to suggest that because I don't happen to support the approach it's set out in this bill, that I don't care about my children's safety when they walk to school than anyone else in this chamber. I do care about it, but I want to make sure we take appropriate measures in order to address these things as well. And that's why I think it's also important that we do challenge ourselves to think about other further measures that we can take forward in order to address the issues around compliance and also the greater use of 20 mile an hour zones in the right location. The committee and Edward Mountain set out in his contribution that there is a, uh, there is a, a number of things that they believe the government should look at taking forward and should explore it is part of their recommendations. So, for example, one of the issues is about the uh, uh, traffic uh, regulation orders and the way in which they operate at the present time. It has been highlighted by local authorities that they act as an inhibitor, a barrier to them in looking at pursuing 20 mile an hour zones within their areas for a variety of reasons, in part because of the onerous nature of the consultation exercise that has to be undertaken and also the cost which is associated with it, largely a cost which is associated with it because of the advertising that has to be undertaken within the local press to make the public aware of these matters. We've been consulting with local authorities. The survey results have been returned to us and are presently being analysed in order to identify what actions we can then take in order to remove some of the inhibitors which they've identified in that particular process to reduce the time frame but also to make it a much more flexible, amenable system for them to be able to utilise as they see appropriate. I'll give way to the member. Jamie Green. 
I appreciate the update uh, from the government on improving uh, the processes, but I think one of the things that we've discussed a lot today is about shifting driver behaviour and the culture around how we drive around our towns and cities. What will the government do to address that issue in terms of education and uh, making that behavioural change that we need to see? It's not just about technical processes at legislative uh, uh, levels. Michael Matson. That's a key part of the road safety framework, which goes up until next year, which we will now have to look at refreshing uh, in order to target. And there's resources which are associated with that around uh, driver education programmes that we support, whether it be uh, some of the programmes are actually, for example, school initiatives in order to uh, promote road safety. Uh, uh, cycle safety initiatives, a variety of different measures that all play a contribution part, a contributing part to tackling this issue. But clearly with the, uh, the framework up until next year is one we'll have to refresh and look at going forward that sets out the range of measures. And I think for anyone, uh, and, I, and I hear the statistics that Alison Johnson made reference to, and we should never ever uh, think that one death in our roads is acceptable. We should have an aspiration as we have in the framework to see zero deaths and injuries on our roads and that's the focus that we have in taking this forward and will remain our focus in seeking to address this matter but as i mentioned the actions that we are taking alongside that uh, we've been engaging with causa to look at what we can do because we have extensive guidance and information in place for local authorities and looking at taking forward 20 mile an hour zones uh, in order to encourage them uh, to do so to look at how we can add to that and actually take a much more strategic approach to seeing uh, the introduction of 20 mile an hour zones within our urban areas in our local authority areas. And that's what we're now taking forward with Clausler as well. But I thought it was very well demonstrated uh, about how it can be achieved effectively at a local level by Claire Adamson in the work that was undertaken by North Lanarkshire Council back in 2001. And the fact that they were prepared to take forward the 20 Plenty initiative within their local area because they wanted to make that a priority and they applied it in a way which was consistent within their local area and the roads that they thought it was most appropriate in which to do. There is nothing to stop our other local authorities from doing that and that's what I'm determined to do in the work we're doing with COSLA to make sure that we see local authorities driving this forward on a much more consistent basis in order to allow local authorities to identify these areas that can actually deliver the benefits that we know that can be achieved by having 20 mile an hour zones in some of our residential areas where that is right. Can I also say that the most comprehensive study that has been undertaken into this whole idea of having a sign only 20 mile an hour, a mile an hour speed limit approach was the work that was undertaken by the Department of Transport, which published, was published in November last year. And it is worth recognising the findings from what was a three-year study which indicated that sign only 20 mile an hour speed limits have little impact on actual vehicle speed. We cannot ignore that evidence. We have to recognise that if we are to tackle this issue, we have to be informed by evidence and do so in a way that delivers the real change that people would expect from any change in the speed limit Otherwise, you undermine the integrity of the speed limit process in itself, which is why it's important, as some of the local authorities and given evidence to the committee highlighted, if you don't get it right, then you bring the speed limit process into disrepute by simply lowering it to 20 mile an hour and having it only sign only, thinking that will simply address the issue. Then, officer, I'm conscious of time. This is a, a complex issue and one which I recognise there are many strongly held views across this chamber. Everyone in this chamber, I believe, has a shared interest in making our communities safer for ourselves and for our children. Nobody in this chamber holds a moral high ground on that issue. And as a government, we will continue to do everything we can in order to address issues of road safety. We don't happen to believe that this bill is the best way to go about doing it but we will continue to take forward measures that we do believe will make a difference and make our communities safer for everyone who lives in our communities in Scotland. I now call Mark Ruskell and up to 10 minutes will take us to decision time. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And in closing, it would be uh, remiss of me not to um, thank many others who've given me assistance in bringing this uh, bill forward to stage one. I'd like to thank in particular the non-government bills unit 
uh, the Parliament's legal team, uh, my researcher, Malachi Clark, uh, and, and many members I've had uh, constructive conversations with over the last two years, particularly John Mason, uh, John Finney, and Claudia Beamish. And I'd also like to thank the 25 members who signed the original bill proposal, which enabled it uh, to get to this point. Uh, and also, I'd, you know, I'd like to thank the members of the REC uh, committee uh, and the clerks as, as well who've, uh, who've given this uh, bill some scrutiny. Um, I'd also like to thank you know, men, many of the members who in this debate this afternoon have offered uh, many kind words uh, to, the, to myself as well. I appreciate that. Um, if I could turn to the contributions, though, I think one of the most um, disappointing things that I've heard uh, in this debate this afternoon has been the absolute myth the absolute myth that this bill is somehow a kind of top-down blanket, one-size-fits-all approach. I mean, it isn't, and that is a fundamental misunderstanding of what this bill is about. And it's very disappointing to hear that coming particularly from Mr. Rumbles, because I've sat in Mr. Rumbles office, I've sat in Mr. Rumbles office over the last two years explaining to him what this bill is about. And I'm sorry, but I do draw the conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, that Mr. Rumbles is an advocate for the motoring lobby first in this chamber rather than child safety. Um, and, you know, don't just take... Well, Mr. 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 Rumbles uh, wouldn't take an intervention with me, and I need to make progress, Deputy Presiding Officer. So I would like to... If Mr. Uh, Rumble sees that comment as an insult, he can reflect can on it. Can I say from the chair that I think Mr. Rumbles is entitled to an intervention after what was said? Well, that's for me to decide. It is for you take... to decide, Mr. Ruskell. I would okay, ask you I'll to take an intervention on that point then. It's a point of order, Mike Mr. Rumbles. It's a point oh, of order. Apologies, I hadn't heard you. It's a point of order. Yeah. I don't wish point to, of order, I don't wish to intervene on Mr. Ruskell because he, he, what he's saying is absolutely casting a slur on my motivations to speak in this and implying that I'm some sort of representative of the motor industry. I don't believe that that is consistent with the approach in our code of conduct and I would like Mr Ruskell to withdraw that allegation. It's not a point of order, may I say, but Mr Rumble's point has been made and I would ask Mr Ruskell to reflect upon what Mr Rumble's has said and Mr Rumble's can take whatever action is appropriate under the circumstances following this meeting. Mark Ruskell. Well, I, I am reflecting on it, and I'm reflecting that Mr Rumbles is using arguments that have been put to the committee by the motoring lobby, which he is advocating. So I stand by those comments. Now, if we can get back to the debate, and I'd like to quote the Society of Chief Officers of Transportation Scotland that, to be honest, know a little bit more about road signs and the rollouts of 20 mile an hour than Mr. Rumbles does. Um, in their response to the committee, and I, I'll quote from their letter, they say, there appears to be a view expressed in the report that such a default is not appropriate as it, as it does not give local authorities the flexibility to devise 20 mile an hour limits that they consider appropriate for their uh, areas. Excuse me, I this stop you there, Mr. Ruskell. Can we have a bit of quiet, please? I understand that people are wanting to discuss things. This is not the appropriate time can be discussed when this session of Parliament has concluded. Mr Ruskell. I'll read out the quote again. There appears to be a view expressed in the report that such a default is not appropriate as it does not give local authorities the flexibility to devise 20 mile hour limits that they consider appropriate for their areas. This is not factually correct. So these are the people who are actually implementing 20 mile an hour who are saying this is not a one size fits all approach. This is proportionate. This allows us to select those roads that we wish to retain as 30 mile an hour, those arterial routes, and do that. So that's clearly, no, I need to make progress now because I've been inter intervened on it a number of times. I need to make progress. Um, now I am disappointed in the cabinet secretary's view on this. And this is the second cabinet secretary that I've worked with uh, under this bill. It does appear, and I hope that I'm wrong, but it does appear that the government is going reverse, in reverse, on its own policy on 20 miles an hour, because the arguments that have been put forward by the Cabinet Secretary here this afternoon go against the rollout of 20 miles an hour that's been done under Scottish Government guidance in Edinburgh, in Clackmannanshire, in Glasgow. It also goes against the advice of the government's own active travel task force. These areas, these local authorities are rolling out sign only 20 mile an hour speed limits. They're not investing in infrastructure 
on every single road. And indeed, the Cabinet Secretary's own guidance on 20 mile an hour is moved away from infrastructure, putting in lumps and bumps whenever we want to create 20 miles an hour. And I think that makes a lot of sense because, you know, we don't actually do that for 30 mile an hour roads. We don't do that for 40 mile an hour uh, roads. We don't create a design speed for every single Excuse road. Excuse me because again, in order Mr. To Ruskell. Can I, can I say to everyone, please stop the rudeness that is happening during this. Mr. Ruskell is actually quite soft-spoken. I would like to hear him, and I think everyone else should give some respect to the conclusion of this debate. Well, Mr. maybe Ruskell. I should raise my voice a bit then, Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer, and we'll get this debate going then. Um, we don't design every single road in Scotland to be the speed limit that it's at. We do rely on signage. We do rely on other compliance measures and education to get that. And, you know, there is no evidence. I mean, the, the, the Cabinet Secretary um, quotes the DFT report. There is no evidence that setting 20 miles an hour on a road undermines the speed limit compliance on other surrounding faster roads. That was actually the opposite conclusion that the DFT report came to. When they looked at the wide area rollout of 20 miles an hour in Brighton, they found that compliance went up on the surrounding roads, the surrounding faster A and B roads. So it's simply not an issue. There's misunderstandings here. If I can turn to costings, I think John Mason made the, 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 the very um, astute point that not every financial memorandum is 100% accurate, and I, I, I take... I, I take some criticism on that. But, I mean, I again believe that the core costs, the substantive costs in this bill, are accurate. Again, they've been worked with those who would be tasked with implementing this bill, the organization that represents all the roads authorities in Scotland. And let's look at the cost, because this measure is 0.75% of the transport budget over two years. And once 20 mile an hour is rolled out on a nationwide basis, we get the benefits then, year after year after year. Scots tell me the life of a road sign is 30 years. We get five lives saved, 750 casualties reduced every single year, year on year. And this isn't a matter of competing active travel interventions and investment against 20 miles an hour. The experience in Europe is that you need both. The experience of European cities like Copenhagen, like Amsterdam, is that you set the speed limits at a sensible level, 20 miles an hour, and you also invest in the infrastructure. So to get this change, to get the change in walking and cycling that we desperately need, we need to start by changing the speed limit. Um, of course, the cheapest thing for local authorities to do is nothing. But that is simply unacceptable. And that's the problem that we have at the moment. We have a postcode lottery. We have this local discretion. And it's interesting to note that, you know, the Cabinet Secretary argues um, for national consistency when it comes to the transport bill and pavement parking. But there's no acknowledgement of the fact that we need national consistency when it comes to 20 mile an hour which I think is disappointing, given that the Welsh Government have now adopted that principle. They want to see every single community in Wales 20 miles an hour, an appropriate rollout. doesn't matter if it's rural, doesn't matter if it's urban. It doesn't make any difference to the children, to the vulnerable road users living in those streets in Wales. They need to see that protection. <sighs> Presiding officer, um, Jamie Green asked, well, what's, what's the answer there? What's the alternative to this? I don't have an answer to that. I don't have an answer to what is the alternative to this bill. I've been engaging with the Scottish Government here for the last two and a half years. He says he's happy to work with me on an alternative. Well, I have been working with his Welsh Tory colleagues who back a national default for Wales. So maybe he should get in touch with them, get in touch with David Melding, and he'll tell you why this is the most effective approach and why we need to move towards this. Um, I don't know how much time I've got left, presiding officer. I've got another couple of minutes, perhaps, or I had a lot of interventions. You can take another minute okay. or two if you wish, but I would okay. draw your remarks to a conclusion. Okay. Um, the, the, the one alternative that the route that has been put forward by the Cabinet Secretary is to change the traffic regulation order process to make things simpler. Now, again, I would point to the people who are going to have to implement this measure. Scots, what they say is that the TRO procedure simplifying it would be welcome, but it's not the fundamental cause of the low uptake to date of 20 mile an hour speed limits. We're therefore cautious on what the actual difference any changes would make to wider 20 mile an hour rollout. So, you know, the Cabinet Secretary can write as many letters as he likes to Scots and local authorities. 
I fear that we're just going to be back in the same place in the autumn, which is local authorities turning around and saying, do you know what? The cheapest, the most effective way to get national consistency is to have a national default 20. We're going to be back at this same place, and I'm going to be up on my feet asking these same questions all over again. To so conclude, presiding officer, um, every child, every person living on every street in Scotland deserves their freedom, their right to play, to walk, to cycle, to live without fear. Every country, every city which values those rights and freedoms across Europe is setting a safer speed limit, a 20 mile an hour speed limit. This is Scotland's moment to put our values first, to put the lives first and to vote for safer streets for everyone. Thank you very much, colleagues, and that concludes our debate on the Restricted Roads 20 mile an hour speed limit Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of a legislative, cons legislative consent motion. Can I ask Mary Goujon to move motion 17690 on the Wild Animals in Circuses No. 2 Bill, UK Legislation Bill? Thank you very much. Uh, the question will be put at decision time, to which we now come. Point of order, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to give advance notice of this point of order on two specific issues. First of all, under Rule 724 of our standing orders, uh, a member is allowed, allowed to give way to another member for an intervention. Could you confirm that there is no part of our standing orders that requires a member to give way, nor should they be instructed by the chair that another member is entitled to an intervention? And on the second point, would you remind the Chamber once again of your regular requests that members who have taken part in a debate should be present for closing speeches rather than walking out in the middle of a closing speech because they don't like the fact they've been criticised? Can I thank Mr Harvey for uh, the point of order? And uh, I would remind mem all members that... Uh, to treat each other with respect, and that is an important point of order, that, that all members treat each other with respect. I did hear uh, the interventions. I was watching the exchange um, uh, that took place earlier. The, the presenting officer did not instruct the member to take an intervention. The presenting officer did not instruct him, but did suggest that when you name a member, it is actually very good practice to take an intervention. And I believe Mr. Ruskell actually responded very appropriately and did take an intervention at that point. And I thought, I have to say, I thought the, the incident was handled absolutely right. Uh, I could see that temperatures were running a little bit heated at that stage. Uh, and this is, a, this is a contentious bill, and people feel very strongly about it. But I would ask all members to reflect and not to recognise that they are, you know, members who do care passionately about this matter and to treat each other the way they would like each other to be treated. But thank you for that point of order, Mr Harvey. Now, we can now move on to... Uh, the first question, motion 17660 in the name of Mark Ruskell, on the restricted roads, 20 mile an hour speed limit Scotland bill, uh, shall the bill be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We will move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17660 in the name of Mark Ruskell is yes, 26, no, 83. There were four abstentions. The motion is therefore not agreed. And the final question is that motion 17690 in the name of Mary Goujon on wild animals in circuses number two bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>